Welcome to our Wednesday Bible study on March the 13th of 2024. So glad you're with us today. Still studying in the book of Acts. You might want to open up to Acts 28 as we'll begin our study of the final chapter of this great book of, of God's Word. As you're turning there, let me invite you to our in-person Wednesday Bible study every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Studying in the book of Matthew right now. We're in chapter 26 and we would love to have you come and be a part of that open discussion about God's Word from Matthew 26 tonight. And going forward in future Wednesdays, you're always going to be considered an invited, honored guest here at Union Hill. We'd love to have you come and be with us. In that service on Wednesday night, we take time to sing. We also take time to pray. And especially if there are, are special uh, requests uh, for us to consider in prayer, we do that. Now, every Sunday, every Lord's Day, we assemble together at 10 a.m. for a Bible study period. We then assemble for worship at 11 a.m. and again each Sunday night at 6 p.m. for an evening worship. Those worship uh, times on Sunday are also live streamed on Facebook. Of course, you may uh, find this Wednesday Bible study video on Rumble or YouTube or Facebook. Uh, but on Sundays, we do live stream to Facebook as we only have the capability of one outlet. And uh, we, we have done that to Facebook for those who have desired that in the past. And we've been, I guess, doing that for about four years now. So we'd love to have you come and be with us in person. You'd be an honored guest. We'd love to have you visit with us if you're in our area. Now, as we turn our attention to Acts 28, Remember in 27, uh, chapter 27, Paul had begun the voyage to Rome, and uh, we found it to be quite turbulent at times upon the sea. And so as chapter 27 ended, they suffered shipwreck. Now, just as it had been said by God through Paul, they would be spared. The individual people would be. The ship would be lost. That's exactly what happened. And so as we open up with 28, we're seeing the aftermath of the shipwreck and the continued journey to Rome. I break chapter 28 down into three parts. I think in verse 1 through 10, you have the first part, which I would simply entitle Miracles on Melita. They find themselves on an island and uh, where the, the ship has wrecked. And there's going to be about a three-month span that they'll stay on this island. And that first 10 verses actually, uh, as we'll find out, reveals three uh, miraculous uh, events. Um, Paul is going to be bitten by a viper. Uh, he's going to heal a, a chief uh, officer's uh, father. And then that's going to lead to many others being healed upon the island. So I simply entitled those first 10 verses, Miracles on Melita. And that's going to be our, our primary focus of today and the content of those 10 verses. We also have in verse 11 through 16, he finally realizes Rome. Paul has long desired to see Rome, to visit there. He wrote about it in his epistle to the Romans, how he longed to see them, how he desired to impart a spiritual gift unto them, to confirm them, to further establish them in the faith. And Paul is now finally going to realize Rome. And so in verse 11 through 16, we have that. And then the final part, really the final half of the chapter, verse 17 through 31, uh, Paul is going to spend two years under house arrest in Rome. And that's where the book ends. It doesn't go on to address his standing before Caesar. We know that he did. He was actually released from that imprisonment for a time only to be re-imprisoned and ultimately killed by the same Caesar that he will appear before with this event. So let us get into Acts 28. In the first 10 verses, I want to begin by reading them together. It's always good to read the entire context that we're looking at. And he says, and when they were escaped, then they knew that the island was called Melita. And the barbarous people showed us no little kindness, for they kindled a fire and received us every one because of the present rain and because of the cold. And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, 
there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. Evidently, the coldness of the weather, snake being a reptile, was in a dormant state, but yet when the sticks entered into the fire, uh, the heat allowed that snake to come out of that dormant state. And, uh, you know, it, you probably know how biology works there. And it latched onto his hand. Now it says, when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said among themselves, no doubt this man is a murderer whom, though he hath escaped the sea, yet vengeance uh, suffereth not to live. And he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. Howbeit they looked when, they, uh, when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly, but after they had looked a great while and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said he was a god. In the same quarters were possessions of the chief man of the island, whose name was Publius who received us and lodged us three days courteously. And it came to pass that when the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and of a bloody flux, to whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid, on, uh, laid his hands on him, he healed him. So when this was done, others also, which had diseases in the island, came and were healed, who also honored us with many honors. And when we departed, they laded us with such things as were necessary. Now notice the first part of verse 11 says, and after three months we departed. So that, that gives us a time frame. That's why I said earlier that on this island of Melita, Paul would actually stay for three months. That's important information as we'll note uh, toward the end of the lesson. Now, as we break down the context, there's some interesting things here that are said and some things that we might need to understand. Now, first of all, uh, the writer Luke says they had escaped. Now, he remember, they are prisoners, or at least Paul is, and there are other prisoners on this ship uh, that likewise are going to stand before Caesar. And so uh, there's a number of them. You know, going back to chapter 11, it, it's very clear. The soldiers' council was to kill the prisoners. So there's, there's more than one. That's plural. And so the, the idea of escaped here is not that they had escaped incarceration like a prison break, but rather they had escaped the shipwreck and the sea. And that's what God had said. Notice in verse 44 of chapter 27, and so it came to pass that they escaped all safe to land. So it tells us what this escape was. And, and the word escape here is interesting be, especially when it's connected to the word safe in verse number 44, because it means they escaped perfectly whole. Uh, they were saved thoroughly. God was true to his word. He had told Paul that none of them would be lost. And the contents, uh, context of, of the scripture here and the meaning of these words indicates that they had escaped without harm. Now, the ship, of course, was broken up. The ship was lost. It was it was destroyed beyond uh, fixing or beyond repair. But the people, those 276 people that had been on board that ship were all safe, wholly intact. And so they had escaped the shipwreck. They had escaped the time in the sea because remember, uh, they were to swim to shore. Again, notice in verse uh, number 43 of chapter 27, the centurion, willing to save Paul, kept them from their purpose and commanded that they would, they which could swim should cast themselves first into the sea and get to land. And then the rest, some on boards and some on broken pieces of the ship. So it came to pass that they all escaped safe to land, or they escaped all safe to land. So very emphatic is that is that declaration, they escaped. They made it to land. They survived the shipwreck. They survived the time in the sea. Truly, God is true to his word. He means what he says. And that should be a great lesson to every one of us with every one of God's words. Whatever it is that God has said, whatever he has spoken within his word, the commands, the promises, the warnings, 
whatever it is that God has uttered unto us, we should take him at his word. We have a reason to live by faith because God is true to his word. And here is one indication of that. He promised through Paul uh, and the angel that spoke to Paul that they would all survive. And God fulfilled that promise. Paul uh, conducted himself in hope from the time period he was told until the time period he arrived safe on that land and the promise was realized. He had an expectation of being saved. He anticipated being saved. And with that hope that he had, he had a realization or it was realized that hope came to pass. And think about what, what he said in Romans chapter 8. Uh, hope uh, that is seen is not hope. For if we have it, why do we yet hope for it? Well, we're saved by hope. And so in this case, Paul, having that hope, that anticipation, that that uh, understanding that God would be true to his word, God demonstrated that he is, and every one of us should take that to heart. So if God says, repent or perish, we should take him at his word and repent and live with hope that in repenting of sin, turning from sin, uh, that God will save us rather than us perishing and languishing in sin. If God says through his son, confess me before men, we ought to know that true to his word, he will confess us, Jesus will confess us before his father when we confess him before men. Take God at his word. But also the warning, if you deny me, I'll deny you. Matthew 10, 32 and 33. If Jesus said that baptism saves... And he did. Mark 16 and verse 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Peter, his apostle, a mouthpiece, an ambassador of his kingdom, of the Christ, said, the like figure whereunto baptism doth also now save us. If God said those things, we can take him at his word. He means it. And so we know that baptism saves. There's a, any number of things that we could speak to regarding God's words, his promises, his commands, his warnings, uh, the, the statement of facts that he gives, we can take God at his word. They escape to land, that guarantees the truthfulness, the veracity of God's word. Now, number two here in this context is regarding the island of Melita. Now, if you look at a current day map, you're not going to find it. You're, you're not going to see it. But uh, knowing the current name, Malta, you might would find it. So the island that we're talking about is the island of Malta. It is about 60 miles to the south of Sicily, and it's about 450, uh, maybe a few more miles south of Rome. So Paul hasn't gotten to Rome yet, but he's a lot closer than when he started, and now he's somewhere around 450 miles from Rome. Now, the term here, Melita, is taken from the Greek word Melite, uh, M I or M E L I uh, T E, a long, uh, or the E with an A sound to it, Melita or Melite. Um, it's a derivative of Malai or Mali. M-E-L-I. Now, in the Greek, when you look that term up, what it meant in that, that day and time from the Koine Greek was honey. And it just so happens that this island was known for its large quantities of honey. So knowing the product uh, that came from this island, it was so named. But it bears a, an interesting point here um, that, that we need to underscore. And, and as you know, if you've read along with me, you've studied with me through the book of Matthew and now through the book of Acts, you're well aware that I use the King James Version of the Bible. Some people might ask, well, why do you use that version rather than another? This very verse of Acts 28 and verse 1 is one reason why I do. In... Um, understanding the translating process. You and I both know that the original writing of the New Testament was in the Koine Greek. It was not in English. English 
is a relatively new language in the earth, um, not especially modern English. So in, in Paul's day, when Luke is writing of these events, he's writing in the, the Koine Greek, or what, what is uh, the Koine meaning common Greek. It was the common language of the day. Now, there are over 5,000 manuscripts, Greek manuscripts, from which uh, you can compile a text in order to translate into English. And what has happened in the past is there are those who have sat down, have taken these texts, like Erasmus and others, and they have compiled from those 5,000 plus manuscripts what is called a majority text. So 97% of the time, those 5,000 manuscripts, 5,000 plus manuscripts, read the same way. And from that, what the majority of the text, so the majority of the text from the Greek language of 5,000 plus manuscripts, to put that in perspective, um, some of the great Greek classics, like the Iliad, Homer's The Iliad, only has 643 original or Greek manuscripts, we might say, uh, originally Greek, and that, that have been translated into English. Maybe you remember reading the Odyssey or the Iliad uh, in maybe, what, 10th, 11th, 12th grade of high school, perhaps, in English composition classes. Maybe it wasn't until you got to college that you even heard of it, but most likely in most cases in, in high school education, the Odyssey or the Iliad are, are part of the curriculum, or used to be anyways. I don't know, sometimes with these modern schools that, that have gone woke and other things, which is uh, a travesty to education, but um, even those only have 643 manuscripts from which to translate. But the Bible is the most well-documented uh, ancient work that we have, over 5,000 plus manuscripts. I think there's only something like maybe 20 of the Shakespearean manuscripts, the, the works of Shakespeare. And so uh, when you deal with that, you understand, oh, that's a tremendous amount. From those 5,000, you get a majority text. So the majority of the time in these manuscripts, you find the word uh, malai or malite that Greek word. Thus, the translation, and we find Melita. However, in one group of these manuscripts, uh, group B, there was an alternate word or another word that was used. It's not found in the majority of the text, but it is in one. And the particular word is uh, Melitin, M-E-L-I-T-E-N-E, -E -E, if you transliterate it. Well, that's significant because it's a different word than the one that's in the majority of the text. And to put it in perspective, that particular word is the name of a city in Cappadocia. Now, if we understand where Malta is over in the, as far as the first century world, it's in the western part of the Mediterranean Sea to that western world, south of Italy. Now, I understand the Mediterranean Sea goes on over towards Spain, and so when you deal with Malta, you're probably more in the middle. But as far as the first century Roman Empire world, Malta is going to be a little east of Carthage and, and even a little east of Rome. And if you were to draw a line from Rome straight south, you would find Malta about there. Cappadocia is way over toward the western part of the of the Roman Empire. And in those few manuscripts, or that one cluster, one group of manuscripts, so using that terminology, they would have had Paul shipwrecked on a, on a landmass, not an island in the Mediterranean Sea, but way up in Cappadocia, far from any major body of water, as far as the Mediterranean Sea, the Adriatic Sea, uh, the Black Sea even, to the north of Cappadocia. So 
There is a problem with that terminology. But what has happened in some texts, you might be familiar with the term Westcott Hort text, they retain that, that word. Westcott Hort text of the Greek is not a majority text. And so they have retained this one word. In fact, in my copy of the American Standard Version, which is the best translation from the Westcott Hort text that you can find, actually has a footnote that says some manuscripts or some ancient texts don't, uh, they have a different word than the one translated Melita. And, and so they actually give that note. It's a scribal error, most likely. Uh, all of these manuscripts would have been handwritten, thus that's why they're called manuscripts. And so they have taken a, a uh, minority text, or they have taken a, a word from the minority of manuscripts. Very few uh, have that word and used it. And which is a clear mistake because the word that they use is nowhere near where Paul actually was as he was headed toward Rome. And so I, I would submit to you, if we're going to have a translation of the Bible and we're going to have a dependable translation, it needs to come from a majority text. And the Textus Receptus, that majority text from which the King James Version is translated, is a reliable text. The Westcott Hort text, not so much in my opinion, because it's not a majority text. And, and we could say more about that. That's just a quick lesson, a little bit of time spent on that. I'm actually going to be uh, conducting a gospel meeting later this year into the month of, of May in which we will delve into that in a, in a stronger, uh, more um, elaborate fashion in discussing how God's Word went from His mind to our hand in the Bible. And we will deal more with, with those particular topics. But that is one great example of why you want a majority text. The majority text puts Paul's location here in Mylita, or the island of Malta, the uh, the text that is not the majority text takes a word from a very small number of those 5,000 Greek manuscripts and uses it in translation rather than the correct term or the term that's used in the majority. So just a, a, a note there uh, in, that, in that regard. Now, Cappadocia is mentioned in the Bible. It is mentioned in Acts chapter 2 and verse 9, there were Jews from Cappadocia in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. And also in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 1, you'll note that as Peter is writing to the Jews of the dispersion, the diaspora, that he writes to Jews, including those in Cappadocia. So it's not that Cappadocia wasn't a, a part of the Roman world that was addressed by the gospel. It just happens not to be in the direction that Paul was going as he was a prisoner on a ship headed to Rome. And it had been hard to shipwreck uh, in that location uh, that those uh, few manuscripts use in Cappadocia. Now, notice here too, as they have landed on this island of Malta, that they are met by some barbarous people. Now, a lot of times in the English, the word barbarous would mean uncivilized, uh, uncouth, um, not people that are associated with society. That's not what it means here. Uh, and, and especially in Paul's day, you have to understand the terminology that was used. In Paul's day, it was a term used to describe non-Greek speaking people. I mentioned a moment ago that the Bible was actually written originally in the Koine Greek, the common Greek of that day, during the time period of, of the Grecian Empire. Alexander the Great, Antiochus Epiphanes, 
those particular leaders, which happened to be in the intertestament period, that 400 year period between Malachi and Matthew that you, you note in the division of the Bible, the Old Testament, New Testament, there's 400 years that are often called silent years where they're silent because God did not speak. He did not address man through a prophet. Malachi spoke, and then there was 400 years in which God did not speak. And then Zacharias comes on the scene, the father of John the baptizer, and God sends an angel uh, to reveal the announcement of the conception of John the Baptist, a mouthpiece, a forerunner of the Messiah. And again, you resume with the, the time period of the miraculous when God would so speak unto man. He would reveal his, his will unto man. During that period, the Grecian Empire had come to power. They had overcome and conquered the Medo-Persian Empire uh, that had conquered the Babylonian Empire, and now that third world power provides something to the, uh, the, the religious aspect or the, the uh, redemptive plan of God in providing a common language. The majority of the world in Jesus' day, in, in this time period of the first century when Paul was on the ship to Rome, spoke Greek. But not everybody in the world did. And apparently on this island of Malta, you had an inhabitation uh, or a, an inhabitants of, of people here that did not speak Greek. Uh, whatever language they spoke, Maltese or whatever it, it was, some say that the original people here were from Phoenicia. That would be lands north of Palestine or at the northern part of Palestine that they had settled on this land. Others say it was people from northern Africa, and so they would have spoken a, a, a language of Africa or a Phoenician language or dialect. Uh, whatever it was, it wasn't Greek. And so by barbarous people here, we simply mean people that didn't speak the Greek language. Now, as you notice here, uh, even though they were a barbarous people or a people that didn't speak the Greek, Greek language, they were not uncivilized people. In fact, they were very civilized, especially in their treatment of the shipwrecked victims. I want you to think about in verse 2, it says they showed no little kindness and received us. Two aspects here that are very important to take note of. They received us. They took us in as their own. These 276 men, some of which were prisoners or would have had the look of criminals, that is, they were chained, they were shackled, or would have been quickly shackled and, and under control of the soldiers once they arrived at land, it was obvious that they were prisoners, and yet they received us. They took us in. They treated us as their own. And you'll see that with Publius and with others over this three-month period. But they also showed no little kindness, no common kindness. What they did went above and beyond what could be expected. Remember the conditions. These people had just been shipwrecked. Now, first of all, based on what they thought about Paul, remember when he was bitten by the snake they thought, well, this man survived shipwreck, but now he's going to die from a snake bite. And, and in their mind, they said, well, he's got to be a murderer among the worst kind of criminals simply because he, he is now going to die this way. Uh, the shipwreck was a punishment for his criminal activity. It didn't get him, so the snake will. That was their thinking. So when they see that these 276 people have survived a shipwreck, already in their mind they have a concept that these individuals are receiving for the crimes that they have committed or because of what they've done, the, the gods are angry with them and are going to punish them. That shipwreck was, was generally seen by such a people as a punishment from the gods. So that's in the mind. Understand that concept. Um, there, there's also, it's a cold time of year. It's raining. 
and this little kindness in kindling the fire, you've got 276 people who are wet from the cold waters of the sea who have just suffered shipwreck and this fire to warm 276 individuals would have been an immense effort. And so no small kindness. It reminds me of the Good Samaritan. What Jesus spoke in, in Luke chapter 10 and uh, verse 25 through 37. Remember when he was asked, uh, what is the great commandment in the law? And he said, uh, love the Lord thy God, love thy neighbors thyself. And and of course, the lawyer was trying to tempt him. And so he poses a second question as, as Jesus has proven superior in intellect to him. Uh, well, who is my neighbor? And Jesus makes him by his parable uh, begrudgingly answer a question in a way that he wouldn't have otherwise wanted to answer. And he wouldn't say Samaritan. He said him that showed him kindness or him that that did good to him. So a, a traveler on the road to Jericho falls among thieves. He's beaten and he's left for dead. A priest and a Levite don't help, but a Samaritan does. An avowed enemy of the Jew. One, there was a constant embitterment and battle between these two, uh, these two uh, individuals or these two peoples of the Samaritans and the Jews. And yet the Samaritan goes to great lengths to help this man. Not only does he uh, help him immediately upon the road, but he also puts him upon his own beast of burden, takes him to an inn, a place of... of of uh, being able to rest through the night, like we would say a motel or a hotel. And he, he doctored him that night, took care of him, and then provided uh, support, sustenance for him through the innkeeper with the intent and the promise, if it takes more than this, I will make it right when I come back through. Why was that Samaritan willing to do that? Well, because he was part of society, he was part of humanity, he was a good person, and he extends a kindness unto that Jew, not because he owed it to him, not because the Jew had a right to demand it who had fallen upon, among thieves, but because he was a good human being. The Samaritan was a good person and willing to help other people. And these barbarous people, these non-speaking or non-Greek speaking individuals upon the island of Malta were just willing to show kindness and to go above and beyond to help. And I would say to us, let us never allow the world to appear more Christian than those of us who are Christians. Those of us who subscribe to the words of Jesus, who follow what Jesus has said, and, and such words as the parable of the Good Samaritan. Let us never be like the priest and the Levite. Let us not allow the world to demonstrate greater acts of kindness or greater acts or demonstrations of kindness than we who are supposed to be providing an example, being the light of the world, and following the example of Jesus. So we got a great example here. In, in these barbarous people of what this little kindness would be. This is a great lesson for all of us. They didn't owe Paul and his companions anything. They didn't have to go and, and extend themselves to the links that they did, however they did. I want you to also notice here, though, a lesson from the Apostle Paul. Because we talked about him getting bitten by the viper, by the adder, the poisonous serpent. Yet, what led to the occasion that Paul would be bitten? Paul was gathering sticks. Paul was not above gathering sticks. So Paul is helping in the effort. He is partaking in the effort. Yes, there is great kindness demonstrated by the barbarous people. But Paul is one, at least within the company of 276 individuals, that expenses his own energy and time to aid in the effort. 
Let us not be individuals who think we're too good to gather sticks. Let us not think that we're above stick gathering as, as we make that application. Paul was willing to do it. Now, what happens is he's bitten by a serpent. Paul is, is affected by by a viper, an adder or a poisonous snake. Now, someone might say, well, you know, today on the island of Malta, there are no poisonous snakes. So obviously this must be an inaccurate, uh, an inaccurate uh, uh, recording by Luke. That's not necessarily true. In fact, it's not true at all. The island of Malta has more people per square acre, per square mile, than it had then today. And with the increased inhabitants, you have a diminished population of those kinds of animals. In the Jordan Valley, uh, in, in biblical times, there were obviously lions and bears. You know, there was a time when Samson uh, ate honey from a lion's belly. Uh <laughs> So there had to have been a lion there for that to happen. There was a time when da uh, when David killed a bear and a lion in the preservation of his father's flocks from 1 Samuel. So there was a time when there were lions and bears there. Even in the times of, of Jesus in the first century, he was in the wilderness for 40 days fasting with the wild beasts. And someone might say, well, there's no lions there today. Maybe not, but there once were. And so as you think about that concept, there, there was a time when there weren't any uh, pythons in the Everglades of Florida too, right? But now there are. Wonder how that happened. Well, time has passed. Activities have occurred involving men and mankind that have changed the... Uh, the environment around them. And so you could think and see where in Malta, as a population expansion occurred, the eradication of such poisonous snakes could likewise also have occurred. So just because there may not be one there today doesn't mean there wasn't in the time of Paul. And notice these barbarous people identified it as a poisonous snake, an adder or a viper, one that certainly would have caused uh, death in the Apostle Paul, and not just death, a, a quick death at that. And so they're watching, they're looking at him to see the effects, instant swelling, instant pain, and even subsequent death, and it doesn't happen. That's miraculous. Paul uh, himself, and this is the one occasion where you see Paul is benefited personally by a miracle. Other occasions he didn't. Paul had the ability to work miracles, but even like in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he wasn't able to heal himself of his thorn in the flesh. So it wasn't a personal uh, matter. It wasn't something of a personal nature, which when we ask the question in a moment, why were these miracles done? I think there's a great significance here uh, that we can point to as to why this uh, happened regarding Paul initially. And then there are other miracles that were done. But nonetheless, in this particular text, the first miracle is going to involve Paul being bitten by a viper, but being unaffected by it as he simply shakes it off. Number two, after three days time, or for the next three days, he is received into the house of Publius. Um, verse number six uh, uh, the chief man of the island whose name was Publius. Now, another thing about what Luke is writing here in his historical accuracy, there's actually inscriptions that can be found regarding the nature of the society on this island even back this far. Uh, inscriptions like the primate of Melita, or the, uh, which was an official title. Publius was the official leader, not necessarily a king, not necessarily a prince, uh, as, as the title would be used in other places, 
but the chief man, the primate of the island, the, the premier of the island, the, the leader uh, of this island. And of course, he's a man of great possession. Those possessions probably uh, were part of that greatness or that superiority that he had in his title or in his office. Well, his father lay sick of fever and of a bloody flux. Now, uh, the, the idea of laying sick of fever here carries the idea that intermittent fever uh, was, was uh, uh, being undergone. There, there was uh, a fever that was there that, that um, may come and go, but it was constant. It would not depart permanently. And of course, as you know, when you have fever, uh, a lot of times the fever itself makes you feel sickly, uh, makes you feel unwell. And then on top of that, there's a bloody flux. There's an, another terminology here, another way to define it or to interpret it, uh, to even translate it is dysentery. He's got a problem with his intestines, probably like a parasitic uh, infection or something like that that is causing a passage of blood. So this man is lying very sick, but Paul heals him. This man is immediately healed from the fever. He is immediately healed from the, the dysentery, the bloody flux that he has had. And so dis, uh, miracle number two is the healing of Publius's father. And for three days, Paul is going to be his guest in his dwelling place. Now, with that being published, number one, Paul is, is not affected by a uh, venomous snake bite. He heals the chief man's father. So now there is going to be others brought to him. The third miracle that we could talk about was the healing of many people on the island. Many people are going to be brought to him. And he is going to heal them. So in verse 10, they honor us with many honors. Uh, there is gratitude shown. There is a lot that is brought to Paul. And when we departed, they laded us with uh, such things as were necessary. When they got ready to leave after three months' time, Paul and his companions or these travelers headed to Rome had everything they needed for the journey on to Rome. So... What is the purpose of these miracles? Why is it that Paul is unaffected miraculously by the snake bite? Why is it that Paul was able to heal the father of Publius? Why is it that that then led to occasions and opportunities to heal many others that were sick on that island? Well, I think there's three things that could be pointed to here. One, the least, in, or the least significant thing here. Uh, is the fact that it garnered the assistance Paul needed and his companions needed to continue their travel to Rome. Because of what Paul did, uh, there were many who brought these gifts so as to help in the travel. Um, that's not the intended purpose of the miraculous, but it was a beneficent result. Just like in, in uh, the time period of the Exodus, when you go back and read in those first 12 chapters of the book of Exodus leading up to the actual departure, there were miracles that were being done. We call them the 10 plagues. And those 10 plagues, while demonstrating the power of God to Israel and the, the power of God unto Egypt, those 10 plagues were as much for Israel's learning they were manifestations of God's power as much to influence Israel as they were to influence Egypt. That when it came time to depart, the Egyptians were giving them uh, things like jewelry and other things necessary for their journey to Canaan. So those miraculous things did have that beneficent effect. That wasn't the the overall purpose, but it was a benefit of those things. Most significant are these two factors. Number one, there is going to be an occasion of Paul to preach here. Remember, Paul is there for three months. Do you suppose 
that Paul having three months on the island of Malta that he would not once try to teach someone about the gospel of Jesus Christ? Would you suppose that Paul having three months time in a location would fail to introduce anybody to his Savior? That he would fail in carrying out the Great Commission as Malta was part of the uttermost parts of the earth? Obviously, Paul would. And these miraculous uh, events would give credence or confirmation to his teaching. As soon as Paul was unaffected, the people's mind went from he's a murderer to he's a god. Little g, of course. They were idolatrous people. But now there is a respect in Paul, and when Paul speaks... There is confirmation of his words when he teaches them about the true God, just like he did in Athens. You would expect that as these were idolatrous people, that Paul would have given them much uh, a lesson or a sermon much like what he preached in Acts 17 while he was in Athens, talking to those very, very religious, albeit idolatrous people. And so Paul would have had opportunity to preach here in three months' time. And the miracles would have confirmed the word. Remember, God had said that he would confirm the this teaching. God would bear witness to their words, to their teaching that he gave them. Jesus said these signs would follow. Remember in Mark 16? This is, a, of course, Mark 16 and and. Verse 13 through 20 could be another section dealing with why you want a majority text and not an inferior text, or or you don't want a, a reading from only a few manuscripts. You want the majority of manuscripts because there are those that would rule out the ending part of, of the book of Mark, Mark 16, 13 through 20. While the majority would contain it, there would be those that would say, because some don't, uh, we're just going to throw it out. That's what's in the, the footnotes of the NIV. That's what the RSV actually did. What was in the footnotes of, of the NIV was often inserted into the text or was the way the text of the RSV was handled. That's why I, I would, part of the reason why I would not use those versions of the Bible, because they're not actually versions, they're perversions of Scripture. But, uh, Jesus said in Mark 16 that as they carried out the Great Commission, certain signs would follow them, and those confirmations or those signs would confirm what was being preached. Remember, one of them was taking up serpents. Well, here's an occasion where a serpent, as it were, was taken up. Now, Paul isn't a serpent handler. That's not the point. He's not handling snakes. But it was the case that he was bitten by a serpent. It was taken up when he was collecting the sticks. It it uh, was warmed up or heated by the flames of the fire and thus was able to bite Paul, but Paul was unaffected. It confirmed his teaching. So Paul preached undoubtedly on the island of Malta. And not only would he have preached, others would have followed, others would have come along in the future and preached the same things that Paul had taught. Maybe even the arrival of letters as these things that Paul had written to the Thessalonian brethren, to the Colossian brethren, to the Ephesian brethren, to the Roman brethren, as these letters, these epistles would be passed around, eventually they would come to the island of Malta and they would have had been exposed to this man, the Apostle Paul. So confirmation of his teaching, absolutely. But there's a third reason here, also of significance, like this of Paul's preaching being confirmed by those miracles. Paul was headed to Rome. And there's no doubt these things would follow them. You've got a great witness here in the chief captain who is preserving Paul and who is responsible for getting Paul to Rome. So language is going to, to be shared information is going to be passed along concerning Paul and the ship the, the shipwreck event, how Paul was the one who who said we would be saved and we were. And now what happened at Malta was going to be knowledge 
for, for others to pass along regarding Paul. And before Paul ever stands before Nero, these events are already going to be known. And so it, it's going to carry weight in those that hear Paul. Remember, at the end of the chapter, you're going to find out that Paul is going to have two years under house arrest where he's going to be preaching. Well, there's no doubt these things that occurred with the Apostle Paul, you know, a lot of times uh, information like that travels faster than the person does. Uh, information can be passed along in various circuits or by, in various means uh, before you can even get ahead of it. And, and so as Paul arrives in Rome, information of, of this nature is going to be uh, known. And so as Paul arrives in Rome, these, these miracles are going to be uh, arriving too, or the knowledge of them, the, the information concerning them is going to be there also. And so no doubt a reason why these miracles were done. They weren't haphazard. They weren't willy-nilly. They weren't just Paul putting on a show. They had purpose. And the purpose of the miraculous throughout the book of Acts was always the confirmation of the word. And so it always was intended to be. And once the word was confirmed, that miraculous came to an end. But Paul was living during the first century, the time of, of the miraculous, the time of the empowering of the Holy Spirit. And he, an apostle, baptized of the Holy Spirit, was able to perform these miracles as confirmation of the word that he preached, of the word that he revealed from heaven unto men. And so that's the reason these took place. And, and thus a consideration of why Luke would have presented them uh, here for us. So miracles on Melita. Some great lessons to be learned from the veracity of God's word. The power of God that confirmed that word. And even the idea of the kindness that we should show the, the Christian principle of compassion and kindness that should be exuded from our very existence here upon the earth, the idea of, of a surety of, of God's word being known today, and the need for that majority text from which the English translation can come, don't depend on versions of the Bible that did not come from a majority text. Now, that doesn't mean that just because it came from a majority text, it's going to be accurate. It still has to be a translation. But if it didn't come from a majority text, from the 5,000 plus manuscripts uh, that, that are known and have been found, then why would you want to use it? You might have inaccurate information. In a lot of cases, you do. So a lot of lessons come from these first 10 verses of Acts 28. Next week, we'll pick up with verse 11. We'll see that Paul realizes Rome. A few things uh, that we'll need to expose there about the text, exposition of the text, but also some other great lessons to learn. So until then, may God bless us, especially as we take confidence in his word, take him at his word, live it out each day, and demonstrate that compassion and kindness to others around us don't let the world outdo you as a Christian.